Okay, so people are still coming in, but let's get started. So welcome everybody to the fourth uh, session we've got here. It's the final session of the first half of this eight part series. Uh, don't tune in next Wednesday because we won't be here. We're taking a four week break after today and we'll be restarting the second half of this on Thursday, not Wednesday, Thursday, June 8. Um, so we look forward to that. It gives you time to read the, give you some more time to read the books for the second half if you want to do that. And even though we didn't have much interest to be in the library this evening, we are going to try it again for the final session on June 29. And we'll do the same thing. I'll send you out an email the week before. And uh, I hope we have more interest. It'll be sunny till nine o'clock at night. And, and it'll be a good way to wrap up the whole series. We'll have a little wine and cheese and a little chit chat. So we'll do all that. And uh, with no further ado, now let me just turn this over to, uh, to Mark. Thank you, Michael. And you all might be gratified to know that Michael and I met for lunch and had all the wine and cheese ourselves. So uh, your loss, our gain. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, when I designed this uh, two-part quartet of books under the theme that I've talked about so far and I won't elaborate on, uh, I purposely picked Song of Solomon for this last book, the sort of pivot book um, published in 1977. Um, as the end of the first quartet, I think it's fair to say that of the books of these eight uh, in this uh, spring series, in count, counting June, uh, there's no writer of the stature and influence uh, other th uh, that can compare with Toni Morrison. Uh, Award-winning, incredibly popular, uh, by people who don't read her in academic courses, also read in academic courses at all level, high school, some of the earlier novels, middle school and up. Um, Pulitzer Prize winner, winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, um, Nobel Prize winner, uh, the first African American fiction writer female on Time Magazine, James Baldwin beat her, for African-American writing, and Jean Kerr, the playwright from the 1960s, Please Don't Eat the Daisies, was the first woman writer of fiction. Toni Morrison um, is in an echelon in this series. You'd have to go back to people like Faulkner and uh, Hemingway. Um, uh, Willa Cather, um, one of my favorite writers, even more so, um, uh, Edith Wharton, but I think literary history has shown that um, Toni Morrison's in a, in a category by herself. So what I hope to do tonight, because the book has that kind of stature and resonance, because I'm assuming many people who came tonight have read the book on their own or in a book group or maybe in an academic environment, which I expect was not true of books like Wise Blood or Woman Warrior, or On the Road, or some of the other books we did before this series. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll have more of a discussion tonight. Uh, I don't mind talking to you, and I have a lot to say that I think you could learn. Uh, but I have less to say about this book because it's so well known, I think. Uh, and at this point, I think many readers of literary fiction are conversant with the conventions of African-American literature and identity novels. I'm gonna talk briefly about this novel in those terms, try to give you some insights, but then turn it over to Michael in the hopes that uh, not so much that you'll ask me questions, but that you'll add your comments uh, to the conversation. Uh, I could hardly teach a course, let's call it that, called We Two Are Here, uh, inviting the voices of women and minorities into the books we choose, and not also be open to the voices of those of you uh, in the room. So let me say that um, it is considered an identity novel in the sense that um, the earlier writers that we were writing about, some of those protagonists may be looking to find themselves. I'm talking about way back when, when we started this great American novel series. But if they were looking for a sense of themselves, 
it was typically in the idea of an initiation novel. It, it was them and their family or them and their profession. Um, uh, George in Winesburg, Ohio has to find out what he is as a man and as a professional. But for those writers, uh, America wasn't a challenge or a problem. It was an opportunity. But for the writers we're talking about this season, uh, America is a challenge. I think it would be a distortion to call it a problem. But for um, the Nebraska immigrants in my Antonia, uh, America is a promised land, but not without its challenges. Most obviously in Woman Warrior, America is a problem and challenge for Maxine to find herself not just as an adolescent, as a woman, but as an immigrant or the child of immigrants, as someone who is and both is not an American in the conventional sense. Now, African-Americans, including Macon, are people who are part of this country and their ancestors before most of us were here. And so it's a problem uh, that runs in multiple directions. This is clearly a story that has mythic, supernatural, you might say fairy tale overtones. Um, there's a there's a cottage in the wood, there's a witch-like Circe, there's a mysterious pilot who carries around um, her name and her earrings and some treasure in a bag. Uh, references are made to Hansel and Gretel. Um, early and late, there's a reference that may be metaphorical, may be symbolic, may be literal. Uh, about flying away to freedom. Uh, there's breaking the cold, cold of uh, uh, Solomon and Sugar Man. And uh, there's a confusion in naming that is very common with immigrants, including these African-Americans. Macon Dead gets his name because he answers where he's from. And when he's asked father, question mark, he says dead, meaning that's his status. And his name became becomes Macon Dead. He's not even named by uh, a slave owner, a plantation owner. Uh, he's named through an immigration mistake. We know that happened to many European and other immigrants at Ellis Island. Malcolm X, uh, when he wrote his autobiography with the help of Alex Haley, who, by the way, published the novel Roots about African-American ancestry, claiming it was his own ancestry, seems that he exaggerated that, but that was 1976. And in 1977, the year this present novel, Song of Solomon came out, Root was on TV in January of that year, record-breaking um, commercial TV attendance to watch that miniseries uh, in a week. Just, it, it not only redefined what TV and a mini miniseries could do, it opened the eyes of many Americans, African-American and otherwise, to the study of genealogy. Uh, the TV show did what the novel couldn't because it had that much more breath. Toni Morrison is not working off that. She began her work on this book well before that series came out. But there was this kind of confluence of influences where in the same year as the TV series, the miniseries of Roots came out, so did this novel. So Make and Dead, oh, I was gonna say, uh, Malcolm X explains the reason he calls himself Malcolm X, X for unknown, is that he doesn't know his ancestry well enough to know what his real surname is. When I first encountered Malcolm X as a person of a political and social importance uh, in my youth, uh, my Catholic upbringing had me read his name in the paper as Malcolm X, meaning 10, because I was used to seeing that uh, as the surname of popes. And I had to be corrected, much to my embarrassment, that he was Malcolm X unknown rather than Malcolm the 10th. So in this uh, novel, uh, his father, uh, Milkman's father, and of course, Milkman's called that for reasons we know from the novel. Uh, he's spiritually hungry. That's another reason. Uh, he's been infantilized by his mother, who has been broken by her past. Uh, we know she's had some kind of odd relationship uh, with her father, even after he was dead. 
which is uh, told to Milkman by his father. And his father is a real estate man who's a racist and whose motto is own things, own things. Um, of course, ownership is what made slaves slaves. And part of the message of this novel and part of the message of Beloved is what you should own is your own past. And so Milkman becomes someone who unintentionally, accidentally goes on a quest for what he thinks will be gold, influenced negatively by the four or five year older guitar. And it turns out that the treasure he is searching for and finding by going from Michigan to Pennsylvania to Virginia, that is the reverse route of a freed slave going deeper south is his own ancestry. And he discovers the meaning of the Song of Solomon. He discovers uh, what is actually Pilate's treasure. And it turns out not to be gold, but the bones of her father, his ancestor, which of course is more valuable. And he learns something about himself by virtue not only of the story, but of language corrected, the correct name of Solomon. He learned something about folk tales and stories by the uh, local people in Virginia who um, essentially initiate him. Uh, and he is empowered by the end of the book, not only to know the truth, but to have the courage to stand up to guitar and the novel tells us to ride the air by flying. Uh, she has insisted, Toni Morrison, now dead a few years, that she wasn't being metaphorical in that. And I think uh, that's true. Uh, but she also wasn't meaning that he flew away to freedom or Africa. In my own reading, my reading is my reading, uh, for what it's worth, um, he dies, but he dies flying. He doesn't throw himself to his death off the top of a building like the inaugural scene, which occurs on the day that he's born in 1931. And notably 1931, the year that Milkman is born is the year that his uh, author, his creator was born. Toni Morrison was born in 1931. I'm sure that's why the novel begins as it does. But Robert Smith uh, jumps to evade responsibility. Uh, Solomon, uh, flies off to Africa to escape his brutal life. Um, Milkman flies into his responsibility. Pilot has been shot. Um, he's learned the truth of his ancestry and somehow emboldened by not his one life, but by his history, um, he jumps at guitar and rides the air, uh, I think to his death, maybe in one version, uh, grabbing guitar and taking them both down. So it's meant to be a fall and a rising at the same time, which is one of the essential definitions of tragedy. There is a gain and a loss that are so intricately interconnected, you cannot separate them. You can't do the math in tragedy. You can't say, well, an awful lot of people died in Verona, Romeo and Juliet, innocent people, guilty people, but it was worth it because there's now a truce that the two families, the Montagues and the Capulets, won't fight anymore. Um, nobody reads tragedy that way. Um, yes, a good thing has happened, maybe, it'll be honored. And yes, terrible things have happened. And it's not a one canceling the other. You have good things and bad things, and that's the knot, what's called the nexus in literary criticism of tragedy. So, keeping in mind that his journey of discovery is a reverse of the slave route, that he's going back not just to his past, but to the ancestral past of his slave forebears, we can look back and think that my Antonia is partly a return to earlier times by the narrator Jim Burden, who not only returns by writing the book about this place that he lived for part of his childhood or, or youth, but he returns to that place in the context of the novel after he graduates college. So there's a returning to a kind of, uh, again, not his homeland and not his people in the sense of his ancestors, 
uh, but a place that shaped him. And in Wise Blood, uh, when Hazel Motes gets out of the army, uh, he returns to Tennessee. And although he doesn't set up his preaching sh shop, his anti-preaching preaching stand in his hometown, partly because I think he doesn't want to be associated with his preacher forebears, um, he, he does it in Tennessee. He's returning to his origins. And certainly everything about his monomania is connected to his being so dismissive of Jesus and Christianity uh, that he becomes more Jesus-centered uh, than most Christians. And clearly, Woman Warrior, the uh, idea of a journey there is not a quest in a physical sense, but a mythic sense, because she has her mother's talk stories to lead her on her way. Toni Morrison's parents, um, one was born in Alabama, um, or rather her father was born in Georgia. Uh, they relocated like many people did to a more racially friendly state in Ohio. Uh, but all her childhood life, uh, they told her traditional African-American folk tales and ghost stories, sang traditional songs. When this was not available, Anywhere in white America, public or private schools, the only place you could find it communally would be in black churches uh, and maybe community centers or uh, preschools or other centers that were being uh, funded by people who were mindful that there was a heritage they didn't want their people uh, to lose. So in this case, the seeker the quest for identity. Who am I really? Who are my people? What is that song I've heard? How can I make sense of it? Is an actual quest. He covers land. Uh, when he's crossing down to Virginia, he falls into a creek. He first takes off his shoes, thinking that he'll be able to manage um, by saving his expensive shoes. And the rocks are so slippery he falls and is completely immersed in the water. In many stories, even stories that don't have a mythic dimension, when a hero, typically a male, but not exclusively a male, goes underwater completely, it's a scene of baptism. Huckleberry Finn falls off the raft and is uh, completely nearly drowned. And when he comes up at the end, he decides to pretend to be um, Tom Sawyer, he renames himself. And Macon is empowered partly, not just by um, what he learns from uh, Pilate, what he learns from Circe, but what he learns from those uh, townspeople and in the woods uh, about traditions and magically by being uh, submerged. There is a meme in a myth of what's called the Antochthonous hero, a Greek word meaning related to the land, related to uh, the indigenous land, that you and the land of a hero uh, is connected. Um, I'll spell it if anyone wants to see the word and not just hear it. It's A-U-T-O-C-H-T-H-O-N-U-S, autochthonous. Uh, it means that the hero and the land are intimately connected he can only discover his past by getting out of Michigan, traveling through Pennsylvania, and going home. Not his individual home, but the identity of his people home. Along the way, he discovers that his left leg is somewhat shorter than his right leg, and so he limps. And there is also a type in ancient literature, in Greek literature, and you can be sure that Toni Morrison knows as much about these things and more than I do. Uh, she was uh, the first African-American fiction editor at Random House, and she did good work there promoting African-American writers and African-American um, uh, course books uh, until she got up the courage and support to set out and become a full-time writer on her own. And of course, uh, the writer that we know her to be um, another meme of these heroes, I'm um, talking about the fact that he limps, 
is that they have an injury to their foot. Uh, there's a, a hero that you probably don't know from the Trojan War named Philoctetus, P-H-I-L-O, and so on. Achilles, of course, has a problem with his foot that leads to a downfall. Oedipus had his feet joined together by having a spike put through them to keep him immobile on a hillside so that he would die of exposure until uh, someone took pity on him. And his name, Oedipus, means swollen foot. In fact, the pus, P-U-S, is the same pus in octopus. An octopus has eight pusses, eight, eight feet. It's a version of the word ped. Oedipus is wounded in his foot and he becomes a searcher because he's trying to avoid his fate. He runs into it because no matter how well, his, how good his intentions are, he is wounded. He's a wounded wanderer. And so is Achilles, and so is Philoctetus, and so is Macon dead. Macon dead limps uh, because uh, he has uh, a congenital problem. He's not wounded by a snake, as one hero is or by um, that spike that I mentioned. And so there are a lot of mythic overtones that are not just African-American, but um, Western civilization. Homer has nothing to do with African-American culture. And it's that kind of encyclopedic knowledge that I think with a light touch, Toni Morrison brings to this masterpiece. So a true tragedy, in the sense of his fall and uh, what has been done to his people, but a joyous com comic celebration of the Song of Solomon, the story of Milkman, who grows to maturity despite his nickname, his sort of adolescent infantile nickname, uh, and becomes someone who loves his past, more than once in the novel, the expression is given, I love you all. Uh, and love is what is at the essence of Song of Solomon. So I'll end by saying that I tell my students, if you're reading a novel for the first time and there's an introduction to it written by a scholar or a teacher, somebody like me, never read it before you begin the novel because they give stuff away. They They don't they're not worried about keeping their reading experience. If you have an introduction written by the person who wrote the book, that's different. Those you should read. But you should always read any epigraph to a novel that is put there by the author. It's meant to be a note of introduction. And the epigraph to this novel is the fathers may soar, S-O-A-R, and the children may know their names. So what is that about? Uh, the fathers may soar not through social economic status, which is what Milkman's fa father misunderstands, but they may so soar in the sense of um, liberating themselves from uh, the, the trauma of slavery, whether they escape mentally, spiritually, or physically uh, from America. But even though they may be gone by flying away, the children that they leave behind may know their names. Uh, that could be the may of a prayer, may peace be with you, and may the children know their names. Or maybe it means might or might not, let's hope they do. Or it could be both. It could be uh, let's hope that they do, and maybe they will, and maybe they don't. They will know their names because although they remain behind, they remember. In Beloved, uh, published some years later and considered by most people her masterpiece, Pulitzer Prize winning, people felt it was a significant contribution to her winning shortly thereafter the Nobel Prize. In Beloved, uh, Setha's mother, Baby Sug, speaks about how you have to have rememory uh, in her ignorance of correct English. She thinks that since memory is bringing something back, it must be a reword. You have to rememory. 
And she talks in this uh, oration early in the novel about loving every part of you. And she lists the parts of the body. And she talks about the different members of the body and that remembering becomes an unintentional pun on her behalf of putting yourself together and making yourself whole. So rememory is not just a matter of engaging with the past, it's connecting yourself as a whole person. And if you're of the mindset of Toni Morrison, your whole person includes other people, uh, um, your people. Uh, these are my people, like Ruth is a statement. Um, and Beloved turns out in that novel to be someone with an animus towards her people, and she has to be exercised. But that's because she had been um, uh, excommunicated by her mother. Well, that's another novel. But this notion that memory is a reconstitution of yourself, which necessarily involves the land and the past. And this is a quest. This is the first novel where it's a physical quest of somebody looking for their origins. He covers a lot of territory, and I'll say to end this portion of my talk uh, significantly by reversing the escape of freedom. I will also say that the reason she picks 1963 as the end of the novel, he dies at 32, born in 1931, dies in 1963, is that it's the 100th year anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, but more significantly, it was the date of the March on Washington. The first truly national, and in some cases, international recognition of the civil rights movement, a, a, a remarkable demonstration with a small d of people who cared about broadening the definition of American history. That's why this novel, hangs its uh, timeline for Milkman between 1931, the birth of its author, and 1963, a high watermark of the civil rights movement. So I'll stop there. And Michael was forewarned uh, that uh, I'll wait on him. Again, if you have comments, I prefer comments to questions, but I prefer questions to silence. So please feel free to contribute. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Jacob is married by the angel of God, winning the fight between them, and therefore Jacob learns his identity as leader of the Israelites. Jacob is one of the earliest to find his identity by the injury of his thigh left by the angel. Yeah, that, that, that's a comment, not a question, right? Right, Jacob is yes, named by the angel of God, yeah. Yes, and, and I, I appreciate, uh, I had forgotten that, and I appreciate that contribution. Should also say that historically, there has been a actual real-time affinity between Jewish Americans uh, of the liberal persuasion, which in the 60s and 70s was many, many active Jews. I don't mean to say that there aren't, there weren't conservative Jews in America, but they turned out, not to be very outspoken, um, liberal Jewish Americans had an affinity for the civil rights movement, partly because they were people of the book. They were people who were taught uh, to do good uh, and to heal the world. And, and their instincts, whether from their religion or their politics or some combination or the way mom and pop raised them, uh, wanted to do good. And they also recognized that there was a connection between the way that black people had been marginalized and put aside and what happened to the Jewish people throughout history dating back to the Bible. And so a lot of Negro spirituals feed off of not just Christianity, but uh, the Old Testament and a lot of Santa Maria and island voodoo uh, because those were the gods that were in those islands because African slaves brought their stories to America, not to the mainland, but to the Caribbean. And many of these black slaves 
took the same position that many Native Americans did, which was, if you have a story, if you have a God, if you have a song that will help me solve my pain and misery, I'm happy to sing it. I don't mean that they were foolish or um, uh, not discriminating. They were hungry for salvation. And if you told them that they should sing this song because this would make them joyful, uh, they were willing to do it and didn't care whether the origin was Christian or Hebraic or African. Thank you for that comment, the person who made it. Who was that person who made it? Janet Krauss. Oh, Janet, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yep, I'll take another. Okay, another one, okay. Please help me understand the flying motif that opens and closes the novel. It strikes me as somewhat silly and escapist. I think of Icarus, but I know I'm missing what Morrison is doing here. Yeah, well, I appreciate the candor. Uh, of course, of course, you'd be the first person to agree it can't be silly. Uh, so uh, in the myth of Icarus, we are supposed to believe that this flying boy, because of his recklessness, has his wings melt and he dies. And his father's ingenuity can make a boy fly, but he can't keep him from being reckless. Um, I think what we're supposed to understand about the flying motif will be explained better through the lens of Beloved. I want you to know I did prepare Song of Solomon, and I actually prefer it as a novel to Beloved, which I also very much admire. But in Beloved, and if this is a spoiler, this is on you. Beloved was written decades ago. If you've never read it, that can't be helped. In Beloved, uh, a woman to save her young child from a life of slavery cuts her throat. Uh, buries that baby, wants to put dearly beloved on the gravestone, but she only has enough money by sleeping with the stone carver to have one word put on the gravestone. And so she picks the word beloved. But the baby is supposed to be dearly beloved because the mother loved her so much. And some years later, that girl comes back as a teenage girl, aged exactly the length of time that the baby had been dead. And sure enough, she has a scar around her neck and she calls herself beloved. And she becomes a kind of incubus in the family, uh, someone who the mother loves, uh, but also feels guilty about. And I think it's fair to say beloved sucks the life uh, out of her mother until another character in the novel and other people realize they have to save Setha and they save her by singing the demon away. And we realize that Beloved is not the name of just one person. Setha got the idea of naming her baby Beloved because she overheard a Protestant funeral service in which the Reverend greeted people by saying, dearly beloved, join me in prayer, whatever you said. That is, she heard the phrase dearly beloved and it made her think of her daughter, but that preacher, that, that minister was talking to the congregation. Beloved in the novel Beloved is all of us. And that's what the love in this novel is. Now, the question about flying, you have to believe if you're going to take Beloved at face value, that that girl who comes back is the same girl whose throat she cut. And if you say that makes no sense, and I have students, undergraduates, I've taught Beloved more often than Song of Solomon, who say, with respect, it's kind of silly, right? I mean, it's just a metaphor. Um, there's nobody really in the room. This is just a projection of her grief. No, she's really in the room. The girl has come back to life. How is that possible? I say to them, you first explain how a Christian nation could have a system of economics that enslaves human beings, sells off their children, and brutalizes them if they don't do what they're told. If you can tell me that that actual fact can be explained, I'll give a shot to how a woman can come back to life. That's what I would say to flying. If you're not prepared to accept 
that the flying is a metaphor and more than a metaphor, that if you are willing to commit yourself to striking out at the brother figure, guitar is the closest thing a milkman has to a brother, who has become murderous and evil, if you're not willing to accept that the act of engaging with that killer, a black man and a killer of whites, that that's not just a metaphor, but a passionate commitment, a revelation of something integral to the character that Milkman has developed, then I, I, I'm at a loss to explain beyond that. In the same way that nobody in this book actually exists. If we talk about Milkman as a character, he's made up. And I think writers have the option to say, you have to suspend your disbelief to understand that when he rides the air, there is a joyous conquest of falling that is meant to be a celebration and a achievement and not just a death. She doesn't say he flies, she learns he learns to ride the air. The man in the beginning falls to his death, but um, Milkman rises to something in his death. I, I hope that's something of a satisfactory, long-winded, but I hope it's something of a satisfactory uh, question. If someone uh, comes to take your child away and make a slave of her, and someone says that mother didn't have the right to kill that baby, that mother was wrong to do it, she should be punished, she should be guilty. The answer to the question, what should a mother do when she's confronted with a choice of either killing her child or seeing it taken into slavery? The answer to that question is, that question should never come up in human life. Sophie should not have to make the choice that a mindless, sadistic, Nazi officer makes for fun, will save a child and kill a child, choose. The immorality of that horrific choice is not in what Sophie decides or what Sepa decides, it's in the premise. Humanity should never have to confront. We have fires, we have floods, we have madmen, we have deaths, we have pandemics. We shouldn't have somebody saying this one or that one or give me that child or kill it. Uh, that's the level of brutality that this irrational, uh, rather than silly, I would say irrational idea of the dead coming back to life or people riding the air. I think if you think of it that way, it's very powerful. Yeah, I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next uh, comment is going back to uh, a book we talked about in the past. In reading this, I kept getting prodded by memories of reading Native Son, and I struggled to reconcile these two stories, different time periods, families, and young men in different economic circumstances, but still facing the same racial issues. I would be interested in your thoughts on how to compare Bigger to Macon and their struggles. Yeah, so, um... Native Son was the first of the novels we did in the fall of last year, before we began this uh, I Too Am Here, uh, 1940, so World War II era. Uh, and one significant difference between that novel and this novel, besides it being uh, you know, 30 years earlier, is there's not even a hint of the civil rights movement in America in 1940. Uh, and he writes an urban novel uh, set in Chicago uh, about a man named Bigger, purposely meant to rhyme with the word we won't say, uh, to be candid and clear-eyed about the brutality of um, what a young man like that faces. And remember, it begins with the alarm clock going off, a ringing of the alarm clock, which in local terms is just he has to get up for work. But in a broader sense, um, it's like the postman always rings twice. Destiny is ringing for him. And he remembers the ringing of that alarm clock when he's at a prison at the end. So that is necessarily culturally a darker, I'm not punning when I say that, harsher 
grimmer novel. You remember the sections are called uh, Freedom and Flight and Fate. Um, very, but you know, it, that, that novel has a political and philosophical agenda. It's not a novel about myth or supernaturalism or forebears or the richness of culture. But a lot has happened between 1940 uh, and 1976, um, and not just the civil rights movement, but a lot of work has been done by American ethnographers and anthropologists, including uh, oh, uh, Nora Zeal Hurston, who was both a novelist and a very distinguished ethnographer into culture of Africa and African Americans. And so a book like this, um, Song of Solomon, could be written because more was known about the dignity of the African American past uh, than was known at the time of Native Son. Now, of course, there are other differences. Uh, a woman author, a male author, Richard Wright had issues. Uh, I don't mean issues in the way my kid says, oh, she's got issues. He had themes he wanted to explore. But a bit, very big difference is the civil rights movement and the kind of cultural enrichment that ethnographic work of the 50s, 60s, and early 70s did for literature in America. You know, by the time she's writing and publishing this book, ABC is showing roots. Um, that's not going to be on TV in the 1950s. Um, by the time she's writing, most major universities, and not just the best universities, have African American studies departments that didn't exist in 1940. Uh, and so there is a cultural shift in the recognition, not just that African Americans are people, are human beings. You'd like to think a lot of people got behind that. Some people are still not behind that idea, but that it was something cultural and broad and that had a, a richness that their America was a different America from our America. When Michelle Obama, uh, I can't remember now if it was Michelle Obama or Oprah Winfrey, you'll help me, said that when o Barack Obama was inaugurated, it was the first time in her life that she felt proud to be an American. And a lot of people gave her grief for that because they couldn't understand whichever of those two women it was, uh, I, I'm forgetting because I'm old, uh, that that was horrific that they couldn't be proud of their country. Well, those people didn't walk in the shoes of African-American girls or young women. You remember uh, that when um, Trayvon was shot and uh, Barack Obama spoke and revealed that he often would walk down a street and uh, people in cars would lock their doors. Uh, and that he had to have a, have a talk with his daughters about the dangers of walking while black. Got it. Okay, well, those were the comments so far. Um, you want to take off from there? Uh, well, I want to I want to say as a way of summation and maybe looking ahead a little bit to where we're going. I want to say that um, the the point of the series. Uh, is that it's a kind of convenient myth and maybe a marketing gimmick, not just for publishers, but for teachers like me, uh, to say there's such a thing as a great American novel. Now it's true, the phrase is used a lot of time, a lot of the time. And I think I said when we began the series that um, in general, um, people in other countries don't believe that there's a great Polish novel. There are great Polish novels, but there isn't the great Polish novel. There isn't the great Serbian novel. And that's because the myth of America, the myth of the American dream, uh, has this notion of being great and greater than anyone else. And I'm not going to make the obvious connection to recent politics and maybe politics returning, but Americans are very fond of thinking that their country, I'm not saying our country because I don't affiliate with this notion, is great and is the best country. And so it's a, it's a convenient thing to talk about the great American novel. And of course, the great American novel, whichever one you pick, whether it's Moby Dick or Great Gatsby or another dozen contenders, often has something to do with the greatness of America as a myth, 
manifest destiny, freedom, God favored, on and on, whatever it might be. Um, the idea that a great American novel could reside in the Nebraska Plains uh, with a woman named Antonia or with a woman um, uh, from Mexico uh, who has a house on Mango Street and a book that we'll read in the next unit that is decidedly not a great book in the conventional sense. It's made up of 40 something little, little stories, very fragmented, very quirky, no clear narrative arc. Woman Warrior was a book that when I first did years ago at the Fairfield Public Library, the people who came to the talk told me in the discussion that they hated the book because it was so hard to read because it wasn't the kind of book they were used to reading. There is an epigraph at the beginning of Fahrenheit 451 by a uh, Latin American author whose name I'm forgetting because I'm old and I didn't think I was gonna quote this, so I didn't write it down for tonight. The epigraph at the beginning of Fahrenheit 451, which is in celebration of keeping books, preserving books is, if they give you ruled paper, lined paper, write the other way. If they want you to write their way, write the other way. And Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury, is not a conventionally written novel. And neither is The House on Mango Street. And neither was Wise Blood, or neither was some of the books we've yet to read. Because one of these things these authors are explicitly revealing is that if you are writing about minority identity, it's not enough to change the theme. It's not enough to say something new. You have to say it in a new way. You have to come up with a new form. And so maybe you have a woman come back from the dead or a man who flies both really and imaginatively at the end of the novel to symbolize his not fall like Icarus, but his rising to glory. You have to find a way that's going to make readers of conventional fiction confused or uncomfortable. It's not sadism, it's not revenge, it's not payback. It's the nature of telling a story the way that your culture has trained you to learn stories. And so as we move ahead uh, to the other novels that we're doing, again, all of these novels uh, by women, uh, we'll see how different they are from a wonderful but conventional book like A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, where even though there are problems of sexual assault and an alcoholic father and death of family members and not having enough money to survive, there isn't the sense that you don't belong in America even though many people in the day of Betty Smith would think that Irish Americans don't belong in America. But there isn't that sense of not being American in the fabric of the story. The house on Mango Street, that girl writing that story, um, that is um, the woman writing the story of a girl with the name Esperanza, autobiographical about Sandra Cisneros, the author, but using the name that means hope. That girl has to figure out, does she actually belong in America? And she does it by writing a book that is imbued with her own, own culture, and she doesn't worry about you and me. So, uh, you so do what, that book, I'll just say, when we do that book, the striking thing is she doesn't say, Many times in my life, I encountered a bias on the part of uh, white Americans. Uh, I was made to feel that I was ignorant. No, she writes a story about growing up in her culture and doesn't apologize that you may not get all the references in her culture, or you may be put off <clears throat> by the fact that the average length of a chapter in that book is two and a half pages. And some of the chapters are only a single page. And if you're one of my undergraduates, especially 25 years ago when the book first came out, you think, how can I possibly write a paper about a book that doesn't give me anything to hang my hat on because I don't know what she's doing? 
while she's doing her thing that we have to learn about by reading the book. Got it. So I had one thing I wonder if you could uh, comment on the uh, the use of the or the deployment of the names of the characters. So obviously you've got you'd mentioned a few already, but you've even you've got in there a Calvin, you've got a Luther, um, you know, let alone you know First Corinthians. And I'm just wondering, and like, pilot and pilot. Let's not forget pilot. Well, and pilot actually is the, is is one that I tried to think a lot about because, on the one hand, you know, audibly it makes you think of pilot like a pilot of a ship, pilot of a plane, but the way it's written, it also makes you think about Pontius Pilate. I couldn't make that connection actually, even though that's the way it's written out. Well, well, was, that, that that comes up in the book where someone hears the name and says, you mean pilot like a riverboat pilot? No, pilot like Pontius Pilate. And the point is, it's one of those names that parents, and some people say this is particularly true of minority or immigrant parents, they hear a name and they like it and they don't worry about whether it's a conventional or respectable name. When people satirize or, or even more cruelly make fun of the various non-traditional names that African-Americans give their children, uh, they're losing sight of the fact that a name is what you make of it. And there are many people of immigrant or minority backgrounds who don't wanna name their children Michael or Mark or Janet to name three of us who are here tonight, because that name has no resonance. And it happens that people will say, I love the book First Corinthians, or I love the sound of Pilate, forgetting that he's an evil person in it. They're not honoring Pilate. They like the name. That's very common with many people who, because of their immigrant or marginalized status, they're not stupider, it's that they don't worry about being respectable because even if they name their son Robert Smith, he still might throw himself off a building. They, they, they're not invested in the American dream of bland names from their point of view. Got another, got another comment question popped up. What does it take to look beyond the comfortable and satisfying endings of popular novels to let yourself be taken further into new ideas, the ones you find in literary tougher novels. No. I don't want to read books on the bestseller list any longer. <laughs> well, here's my advice. If you, if you have to stop reading one kind of thing to read another, that's a choice you'll make. I'm a great believer. When, but before I became a book group leader, I might have read four books in my early life as a college graduate student, young father and husband that were bestsellers that had recently come out. At least half of those were because someone gifted it to me because they thought this guy studying English, she'll like a good book that just came out. I really wasn't interested in contemporary fiction. I read literary history. I read the old masters. I was a graduate student going for a PhD in Victorian and modern British literature. You can't go by me. But I would say to the person asking that question, who, what's the name of the person first name asking the question? That was Joanna. Okay, Joanna, I'm just I'm not outing you. I just like to call you by your name in the sense of having a conversation. Joanna, what I would say is read enough good literary fiction to recognize that most of it is not conventional. Most good literary fiction has its own marks of distinction. They may be in a narrower band of diversity or variety in terms of how they plop the book, but you have to have some kind of baseline to appreciate how radically different a book like House on Mango Street is. House on Mango Street is a, a terrific example of writing against the lines. And I would say, that in the same way we read a book, uh, literary fiction, in order to meet people who aren't us, uh, force ourselves not to just think by our own mental rhythms, be open to the fact that some books invite you to think so radical, radically different 
that you may have to believe the dead come back to life or people can fly. Life After Life, which I lectured on at the Westport Library uh, recently, uh, is a book in which a character, you find this out very early, dies and is born again and again and again without explanation. She has a life after life after life. She has a significant experience of different kinds during the Second World War. It is a glorious celebration of life and responsibility and family. It is completely illogical, but it makes a great ethical, moral, literary sense if you give yourself over to it. I'll give this example uh, as maybe my last comment, Michael, if you don't mind. Um, you go to the movies because someone recommended a foreign film to you and you find that it's not dubbed and the better movies should not be dubbed, but it has captions in English. And if you're lucky, they are legible. And you hate the idea that you and your housemate have gone out on a date or evening's recreation, and now you're gonna to have to work. You never intended to go to the movies and read. And then the beginning, maybe for the entire movie the first time, it's very onerous to watch what's happening on the screen and look down and hope it's again, not in white letters on a white background and read what they're, what they're saying. But once you go once or twice and you get the hang of it, you not only get better, you remember in retrospect that movie as being in English. You remember hearing the English words with the timbre of the man who was speaking, even though he was speaking Dutch. This has been tested by other people, not me. It's an informal poll that I've done with many of my friends, fellow graduate students, when I was a graduate student and my own college students. You get the hang of it. It seems like you never will, but you do through repetition and commitment. Remember the first time you had one of those pencils um, in pre-K or K or first grade? and you were writing on paper that was so coarse, it had pieces of wood floating in it, and you had to write the word cat, and it took you three minutes to remember how to make a C and an A and a T, forget spelling it, you had to remember how to make C-A-T. All of us can do that now in a microsecond because we kept at it. If you're committed to otherness, you just have to spend a lot of time with otherness. And to Joanna, what I say to all of you, get other people to do it with you. If you're not part of a book group and you know someone who's been coming to these things or you have someone who is a fellow traveler, suggest that once a month you agree to read a book that's outside your comfort zone. Maybe you're gonna read reviews, maybe not, uh, and that you will do it in a group. Even if collectively, you're confused, you will learn more about what the book might mean if you're talking to other readers. And with that, I'm gonna say good night. I'm gonna wish all the mothers in the audience a happy Mother's Day coming up in a few days. I'm gonna thank Michael again for his great partnership. And I will be back in June when we pick up this series with another four books. Well, thanks, Mark. That was really great. And uh, I'm sure everybody got a lot out of it and enjoyed tonight's session. And uh, we'll see you folks in the first week of June. Remember, it's going to be on a Thursday. You'll get a reminder. Uh, we're switching to Thursdays. Um, so see you, see you in four weeks. Good night, everybody.